welcome to Two Boomer Women. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. I've been talking with Boomer Women for almost a decade now. (laughs) Well, I guess I've been talking to Boomer Women all my adult life. Uh, Reinventing myself several times along the way, though, but always focused on us, Boomer Women. With this incarnation of Two Boomer Women, I'll be interviewing other women who have a message of interest for our demographic. If you want to hear about or learn about something specific, let me know and I'll find someone who understands us to talk about it. There's a contact page at twoboomerwomen.com. If you want to be a guest on Two Boomer Women, bring it on. There's an application form at the website, too. Finally, this show is all about conversation. We women know its value. We know how to do it, and we must perpetuate the art form. So let's get started with today's show. Welcome to the Two Boomer Women Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. When today's guest contacted me about coming on podcasts, she had words like meditation, gratitude, positivity, and several others that had me wondering if she'd been peeking at my upcoming course. When Sarah discusses meditation, she weaves facts from basic biology, neuroscience, to educate her audiences. I think we can all agree we've heard of the benefits of meditation, even if we haven't ever considered the neuroscience side of it. And personally, I'm really curious, so let's get started. Sarah Webb, welcome to the Two Boomer Women podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Before we get to the science, though, can you explain how and when you found meditation and made it part of your life? Thank you so much. I love talking about meditation because it's basically my hobby. (laughs) It's something that I have always been drawn to. I think the first kind of meditation, although it was open eye meditation that, that I dabbled in was over 20 years ago when I started doing yoga. And at the end of yoga, when we would lay down in that corpse pose or shavasana, the final resting pose after you've done all the asana work, the teacher would lead us through a little meditation. And after I had some interesting experiences where I maybe saw a color that she said, you might see a little bit of a purple color inside of your third eye. I got really excited. And I'm like, I want more of this. And so I started trying to find a home practice, a home meditation practice. And it took me several years to actually find the kind of meditation that worked for me. So I started meditating regularly and don't get scared or fall off your chair or, or eject from your seat, but I meditate two times a day for at least 20 minutes each time. And some people say, how do you find the time to do that? And I say, I don't have time to not do it. It makes space in my life. So I found this particular kind of meditation called transcendental meditation. I know that sounds really scary and esoteric. You can call it TM. And if you want to know more about it, you go to tm.org, tm.org. I'm not being paid to say that. I'm not a TM (laughs) teacher, but I found myself a TM certified teacher and went to a four-day course. Well, I went to an intro session and then I paid for the four-day course. It's two hours each day. And they taught me this mantra that's a thought word sound. It doesn't mean anything in any language. And I just gently and easily and effortlessly repeat the mantra in my head. And if I forget about it, I just come back to it. And it's taught me so much self-compassion because of that exact process. And I think mindfulness has the ability to teach us this too, but for whatever reason, TM clicked for me because when we forget the mantra, or get distracted with our thoughts, we don't chastise ourselves. We don't. We come back to the mantra and easily just begin to say it again. And so it's taught me a lot of basically self-love. And that begins with compassion. And stop, instead of saying, ah, why was I doing that and getting frustrated with myself? I give myself a large dose of grace. And meditation has been transformative in my life. It has gained me the ability to witness my life. We call it witnessing in yoga and meditation. It's that 30,000 foot view or 
that separation, you know, a great yogi said that there's a moment between stimulus and response where we have a choice. And it has lengthened that time period between stimulus and response so that I can make a choice as to whether or not I want to react in the same way that I'm accustomed to and that maybe I was taught or that my neural pathways have guided me to, my habits. Or I can make a different choice, a more enlightened choice, a more educated choice, a more compassionate choice and respond instead of react. A couple of thoughts there. I used to think of meditation as, oh my God, like I'm doing this for 30 seconds and my brain is wandering. Um, and I found with time, I mean, my, my meditation time is pre-bed. I find it just a beautiful way to just bring everything down uh, mm. so that I can go to sleep. But several people that I've talked to who are big into meditation say exactly, I think what you've said is, is forgive yourself and just bring yourself back. Bring yourself mm-hmm. back to where you need to be. And so, so I'm glad that, you know, someone like you who for whom meditation is such a major major part of your life Mm -hmm. you're still saying the same thing and then you were talking about that gap and Mm -hmm. and I was thinking that you you talked about habits in terms of the react but doesn't the response then become your new habit over time because that runway has lengthened yes yes and that's how we change the biggest problem with change is just not doing the thing that you're so accustomed to doing because most people don't realize how much of their lives are run by habits. Even the most eccentric and most creative person, at least 40% of their lives are run by habit. And for those of us who like doing the same thing or like familiarity or really don't like change very much, 80 or 90% of our lives are run by habit. And that's great. It's our brain's natural tendency to make life easier and to make choices simpler. I mean, think about if you had to, every single time you went to the grocery store or every single time you went to go buy yourself a new shirt. Okay, what is it that I like? How, how, how do I make this decision? We already have that decision made. We've weighed all the options and then we have a familiar choice. And I love how you talked about this gap between stimulus and response and then the new response actually becoming the reaction. And that sounds so simple, but it really is a lot more complex than what you're saying. It's taking that time to actually continue to do the same thing over and over again, over and over again, and continuing to do that even when it's hard and actually, especially when it's hard, those days when we don't want to do that new thing, whether that's three minutes of meditation or 10 minutes of exercise, whatever that might be, It's getting over that 90 days because people say it's 21 days, but really it's not. It takes about 90 days to really solidify a habit because, I mean, we see it every single year. Everybody's like, oh, I'm a new person on January 1st (laughs) when really it's just the next month. And if you're really going to do something, you don't have to wait 365 days to claim that you're going to do something. You'll do it on a Tuesday in September. Doesn't matter what time of day. If you're done with X or if you're going to start why, that's when the change will happen. And I do want to go back to one thing that you said, because your fashion of going about meditation, your your strategy, rather, your strategy for meditation is, first of all, a really great way to have it hack, because you're going to go to bed every night. And so you're utilizing that time when you have nothing else to do and you can meditate right into sleep. And that is a time when the brain is in a hypnopompic state. When we first wake up, the brain is in a hypnogogic state and right before bed, hypnopompic. And you're hearing that hypno, like hypnosis, 
Because when we go into meditation, it's very similar to the brain waves that a hypnotist or a hypnotherapist would put us in because those are the subconscious brain waves. Our brains are in those lower frequency states from the ages of zero to 10. And particularly between like four, five, six, seven, that's a time when our brains are establishing beliefs, core beliefs that we have about the world around us. So when we go into those lower than beta, because when we wake up, we gradually come up into beta brain waves. And when we go into those lower brain waves like alpha and theta, and then delta is deep sleep, but most meditation is in alpha and theta, we're actually accessing the subconscious. So congratulations on using that hypnopompic state of your mind. And if you want to really up your game, you could also use the hypnagogic state in the morning because that trap door between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind is open or, or at least very, very thin. So it's a great time to basically manifest. If you want to change something about yourself, you can use that time to insert the new habit, insert the new belief, use a mantra in English about some characteristic or habit that you want to implement in your life. But I'm I'm curious about what you do actually during that time. Well, waking up, that is dictated by my dog. So (laughs) she doesn't really understand that I might like, you know, like, I don't know, 10 minutes. Does that sound reasonable? Um, it's like, sure. no, I want to go out right now because as soon as I go out, I get to eat. And she is ruled by her stomach. <laughs> so, sure. So, what about right after she eats? Could you sit down right after that? That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, actually. Because your brain is still waking up. It's not yeah, like we're like, that. boom, way up already into it. Yeah. I look forward to winter because I can go outside with my eyes closed and just let her do her thing. We're digressing. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go a little bit further into, I think you've just talked a little neuroscience, mm-hmm. but before we go there, you know, you were talking about, you know, reaction versus response. Mm-hmm. And everybody knows I come with notes and I explained to you before we we press record that I have notes, but I'm bouncing all over the place now because a practice of gratitude, Mm. doesn't that also help creating the new habit of response over react? Yes. And I'm writing notes too, because I want to make sure I circle back to gratitude. But first, I just want to tell you and all your listeners and anyone who feels like they are cynical or negative and they want to change this about themselves. I want to let you in on a secret. It's not your fault. This is a physiological homo sapien response that's keeping us safe. Our subconscious mind is consciously, it's using our conscious mind to subconsciously scan at all times for problems to keep us safe. Now, because we are no longer hunters and gatherers, we don't need to worry about an invading tribes person. We don't need to worry about a saber toothed tiger, which that causes the fight or flight response. I'm sorry. I'm I'm just, I've just moved to an area where the first thing I do is I scan a few trees to make sure there's no, no cougars. (laughs) (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) Anyways. So, but, but that's unusual. That is unusual. So you've got literal cougars outside of your door. Well, not, not often, (sighs) but just often enough that I'm going, you know, I just, (laughs) anyways, I'm sorry. That was a total. Remind me to never come visit. Oh my goodness. That's (laughs) Frightening. Oh, dear. Talk about the claws. Okay, so <laughs> you might have a reason to go into a fight or flight response. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to blow your argument right out of the water. <laughs> no worries. No, I think that's awesome and hilarious. But most people who live in suburban or semi urban or urban areas <laughs> don't usually have to worry. Even if we live on a farm, usually, like, there's not going to be a stampede <laughs> these days. 
I'm sorry about you cougars. I hope it has a lot of redeeming qualities. I imagine that it does. <laughs> Nevertheless, typically, you know, we're we're not having to worry about an invading tribes person at least anymore or somebody crossing over the property line that we need to tell them that they're trespassing. So the point is our, our bodies still go into this fight or flight. And now the fight or flight is prompted by traffic and our boss or our spouse or our daughter-in-law or whoever it might be that, you know, our neighbor or that person who continues to call and won't take us off the list or, you know, just these frustrating things about life that over time will cause us to go down that neural pathway that leads to frustration. And the good news is that you have a number of different hacks, tricks. I call them pocket-sized tricks because you can take these little bits of information and just put them in your pocket and then pull them out habitually at opportune times. And one of those things is, yes, gratitude. And I started making a gratitude list every single morning on February 27th, 2020. I had no idea that the shutdown was coming. Just serendipitously, I started making a gratitude list. My brother and I became gratitude partners and we vowed five things every morning before we got out of bed to text one another. Five things that we were grateful for. Today, I've been practicing gratitude for, what is that now, two and a half years and I have multiple gratitude partners. My brother and his partner are on a group text. I have two friends of mine that are on another group text, another two friends of mine that are on a group text. And so we send gratitude lists that are sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Sometimes they have affirmations sprinkled in there. And you are absolutely right. Getting back to your original question that when we use gratitude habitually, it's going to help us to get out of that automatic, oh my gosh, fight or flight, something's wrong. And to look for the silver lining, to look for the good, to focus on not the grass is greener over there, but the grass is greener where I water it. And that's what you do. You water your own garden by being grateful for what you have. Because really the definition of gratitude when we're thankful for something, it means that something has already happened. So this is bringing happiness into our today. So often I hear my clients or people who come up to me after I give a, an inspirational talk, they come up to me and they say like, how can I be happy? How can I get out of this state that I'm in? And they're saying, you know, well, I feel like if I can just get to this point, or I feel like if I would just have this thing solved, or if I feel like if this person would just be out of my sphere, it's, it's always like the donkey with the wire and the carrot in front of them, that they're constantly walking after the carrot. They're never going to get that carrot. It's like, I used to drink at this bar in Dallas and they had a sign that said free beer tomorrow. Every time I went into the bar, it said free beer tomorrow. If you put off when something is going to be good, it's never going to happen. It's always going to be tomorrow because we live in now. And so gratitude is a practice that brings that happiness into today by being thankful for the things that we already have. And I use it in order to be thankful for the challenges in my life. If a baby fell down every time it tried to stand up and learn how to walk. It never would have learned how to walk. If it's, ah, forget it. I'm never going to get this. <laughs> when we build muscles, whether it's, you know, walking up 10 flights of stairs, that's literally ripping our muscles open so that they can heal and grow and get bigger. So it's through challenges. And it's like, we forget this, you know, I'm 41 years old and we're in school all these years and we have quizzes and we have tests and we have challenges. You see it on, I don't watch it on television, but all these reality television shows, it's always a challenge. What happened that we think that life isn't supposed to challenge us anymore? If we can see this challenge as an opportunity to grow, which is what gratitude helps us do, 
And if we can use resources that we have in our back pocket, like affirmations, then we can begin to make our life into a game or, or begin to play as we go along. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to just go sideways ever so slightly mm-hmm. because many boomer women grew up in the 60s, early 70s when TM, Transcendental Meditation, was that thing that people in long flowing robes and long hair <laughs> did. And <laughs> and I just, could you touch on that again just for a moment to emphasize that it's it's not that way out there thing that hippies and back to nature people only do. Maybe they only did it, but now it is a really mainstream Mm -hmm. and effective way yeah absolutely i do want to temper all of my next statements with tm is not the only way it's what worked for me i mean some people learn it and they're like "Eh, i found something else that works better but i believe the beatles were very influential at the time and today Lots of celebrities in California and the like have learned it. Uh, Oprah, Ellen, they've allowed anybody on their team to learn it for free. Let's see, the comedian Jerry Seinfeld, the filmmaker, I read his book, I can't recall it right now. I guess I'm having one of those um, moments in my brain where I can't think of all these. There's lots of different celebrities out there who have learned it. And that is part of TM's business model. They wanted to bring it to LA so that it would become more mainstream. (laughs) It just so happened that it ended up being picked up by the Beatles. And of course, that was part of that free love movement. But it's absolutely a very normal. I mean, my teacher doesn't have long hair or well, wear bell bottoms. He's a very normal person. And the thing that I love about it is that it's not an online program. You actually learn in person at a TM center. And I think at some centers across the country and the world, they are in the home, like a home office of the TM teacher in Tampa Bay, where I reside, it's actually a TM center. So I feel very lucky that we actually have a place to go and because I don't know if I would have gone to somebody's house but in any case I regularly go and meditate with other TM meditators and they are very normal you know CEOs and moms and you name it they're just very normal people it is not affiliated with any religion and that's one of the things that I liked about it because previous to finding TM I was going to some Buddhist temples and sometimes they were like singing and chanting to like this Tara goddess or something. And I didn't know what that was. And I didn't really like care. I didn't need to subscribe to it. I didn't, but I I like that there's not, I mean, sure there's a guru who brought it over here and they, they say like Jay Guru Dev. Thank you, Guru Dev. I think at the end of every meditation, but there's no homage. There's no prayer. There's no, know anything weird about it I find it to be very accessible and I think that the four-day course is very helpful because especially today in the 20 in the 2020s we have so much in the culture about what meditation is and what meditation is supposed to look like and and how meditators are supposed to look when they're doing it and I mean, I've heard of meditation practices where they say you can't cross your arms, you can't cross your feet, you're obstructing the energy, and there's none of that. And in fact, the thing that I love the most about TM, as opposed to mindfulness, because in mindfulness, you're supposed to like let the thoughts go and let them pass by like they're on a river, you know, and and I'm like, well, what is it? A a leaf on the river? Is it a stick on the river? And where is the river? And where's the river flowing to? And is it cold outside? My mind will not shut off the questions. I, I cannot stop thinking. 
And what I love about TM is you don't have to stop thinking. You have the mantra. You have some idea of the mantra. It's effortless. And you can continue to think. For me, I liken it to if you've ever gotten a song stuck in your head and it's just kind of playing up there, you can still think when you have a song stuck in your head. It's not like it is on a loudspeaker and you can't think at all. You can still go about your life. And so that's how I see the mantra. It kind of inhabits that space up there and you can still think. And somehow it's like magic. All of a sudden you get to this serene place Not every time, but sometimes. And you're like, oh, what time is it? Oh, it's been 20 minutes. It just makes it so effortless for me personally. But you don't need to do TM. You don't have to do anything specifically. I I think the biggest thing is just finding the kind that resonates for you. I mean, I meditate with some people who have to use a meditation pillow and sit up straight and If they have an itch, they can't itch it. (laughs) They can't scratch anything. That's that Zazen Buddhist meditation. I would never subscribe to anything like that. No way am I going to put myself (laughs) through that kind of torture. But it works for her. And so we can meditate together. And I have some people who need music. I don't need music for my kind of meditation. I can do it on a plane. I can do it in the back of an Uber. I I don't need silence. I don't need to sit in lotus pose. And so I... I love how accessible and portable my style of meditation is. And I think that there are a lot of kinds of meditation out there that are very accessible and portable like that. Some of them you need a, an app. But I think the point of using an app like that or any technique is once your brain has learned how to access those lower level frequency brainwave states while you're awake, your brain knows how to do it. And then you can branch out and try different kinds of meditation. Thank you for going into depth on that. Because as I said, I just didn't want anybody going like, oh, TM, that was that thing. Uh-huh. And, and tuning you out. Now, the last question, or I guess <laughs> the next question about TM specifically is, mm-hmm. is how do you get your mantra? Like, is, and is a mantra different from every other person? Like, is yours different? Yeah. Good question. Yes. It is a personal thought word sound and it is mine. I've never spoken it out loud. I mean, he gave it to me and I verified it, but it lives inside of me. I don't share it with anyone. So uh, I don't know how many mantras there are, or if I might have one with someone else, but I've even gone to advanced trainings and been around other practitioners and we don't discuss our mantras. We, it's like planting a seed. You don't, rip up a seed you know you plant it inside of yourself and you allow it to germinate and allow it to grow and allow it to flourish so the teacher does this little ceremony that is the only kind of weirdish thing there's like a 10 minute they call it a puja which means like reverence or something like that it's just a little uh, gratitude ceremony and it's in hindi or some language like that i'm not even sure but they tell you what it all means and then at the end of that the teacher gives you your mantra And then you sit down and you practice for five minutes and then they ask you how it went and then you practice for 10 minutes and then you keep coming back. You go home and practice it. And so there's a lot of support involved. And this was really helpful for me. I need to know that I'm doing it right. (laughs) That's just my personality. And I think that's a big hurdle for a lot of people who are trying to learn to meditate. They feel like they're not doing it right. They feel like it's supposed to be this thing and it's not doing the thing. They feel like they might be supposed to be levitating or that they're supposed (laughs) to reach this calm automatically. And so there's so much expectation. And so that's what I tell my clients. Number one, just let go of expectation. Whatever you think it's supposed to be, it's not. It's about regulating your nervous system and allowing it to just calm down so that it's basically like, When you need to shut off your computer or restart your phone, it's a reset. It's a restart so that everything can get organized back to the way that it was before. And then you have a fresh start and things just seem more organized. Every single time I meditate, even if it's not a great meditation, I have more clarity. My shoulders are more relaxed. 
And like I said, it creates time in my day. It opens up my brain to seeing things in a different way just by getting quiet. It's like if you are a person of faith, they say that prayer is talking to God and meditation is listening. The body does have a lot of wisdom. And I'll I'll throw a little bit of um, biology and neuroscience at you. All around us at every single moment, there are billions of bits of data. That's billions with a B. And the human brain is pretty phenomenal. Our brains can process around 11 million bits of the billions of bits per second. But the rub is that we are only conscious of between 40 and 50 of the 11 million bits per second not 40 or 50,000. On average, we're conscious of about 45 out of the 11 million bits per second that are available to our brains and our bodies. I did the math. We are conscious of 0.04% of all the information that we have available to us. 99.96% of the information that's hitting our brains and our bodies is being processed by what? Our subconscious. We also have 11 million sensory receptors in our bodies. So five senses, 11 million sensory receptors, but 10 million out of the 11 million are dedicated to our sight. So if you want to access the 99.96% of information that already resides in your body, but you're not conscious of, then just simply shut off 10 million of your 11 million sensory receptors or close your eyes and go inside your body. This is why they say that there are answers in silence. This is why they talk about the wisdom of the body, because there's literally millions of bits, billions, 11 million bits per second, and only 45 are we conscious of. This is how we reorganize and how we access brainwave states and how we access information. I mean, we already have some access to it. You think about when you just have that knowing that that person is lying, or you just have this strong intuition. That's your subconscious that's kind of bubbling up to the conscious level. It's like, but but your logic is like, no, those 45 bits that you're aware of is like, no, that doesn't make any sense. And then a few weeks later, you're like, I should have listened to myself. I knew it. And it's because of that information that was already in there, but we weren't admitting on a conscious level. So if we make a practice and create a space in our bodies for our brains to be able to actually get into that state, then we can become aware of all this information that we're already processing. How many of those billions are just the functioning of the body? Is that part of it or am I missing the boat? Here? Sure. Some of it, is, absolutely. You are right. Some of it is your body bodily functions. But it's also the outside environment. Sure, you're absolutely right. Right now, unless I draw your attention to it, you're not thinking about what it feels like in your right big toe. Right now, you're not listening to the sound of the air conditioning. You're not being consciously aware of whatever sound is outside of the window or in the next room. But especially when we're around people, we all energetically have an electromagnetic field. It's been proven by science that our bodies produce a toric field, an electromagnetic field. So talk about hippies and vibes and vibration. Our bodies literally have an electromagnetic signal. And we have very specific electromagnetic hertzes that line up and down of our central nervous system. Our central nervous system is where all of our nerves emanate out from. And here's where the science meets the spirituality. That's also where all of our seven main chakras are. I know that sounds woo-woo to talk about chakras. Okay, she's going a little off the deep end. Chakras, each one of them correspond to a very specific gland that makes up our endocrine system which is what? Our hormones. That's how we experience emotions. Every single one. So if we can 
tune into our bodies and let's say we've got an issue with our coworker or daughter or dog trainer. And this is something that is really just eating us up. Maybe we can sit down and this is what I teach my clients. We can sit down, tap into the body, shut off 10 million of our 11 million sensory receptors, go to this space and breathe into it, reintegrate it into the rest of the body. And then ask our bodies, because we are repeating the same vibrational patterns over and over again. Science proves every seven years we're repeating the same. It's like the first seven years of life. You could just lay it on top and lay it on top. And if you had a trauma at age five, it's going to get repeated at age 12 in a very similar way. This, this is science. This is not Sarah Webb's yada, yada, but it actually gets repeated. And I, I can point to some resources. So if we can go back and I call it a same similar event. Okay. When is the last time that I felt this way? Oh yeah. I remember when we were going through that big move and I felt like whoever was out to get me and then, okay, let me, let me go back in my history. When's the last same similar time I felt this way? Oh, I was 17 and we were at the dinner table. And I remember that my mom accused me of And we can continue to trace this back to patterns that we have long established when our brains were in that hypnotic state. We had a a little T trauma that has eventually made its way and become a big T trauma because we continue to repeat these frustrating or sad or fearful patterns in our lives because energetically we haven't solved it. That's the beauty of the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind suppresses information until we need it again, which is great when you experience a big T trauma like I did. I was raped very brutally and I did not process any of it until I was ready. But go back to Cro-Magnon man or or homo, Homo sapien, you eat a red berry. It makes you sick. You don't walk around going, don't look for red berries. Don't look for red Next time you come up upon some berries, you say, oh, I'm going to take this file out. Does this look like that red berry that made me sick? Okay, I'm going to stay away from that one. So our big T traumas and little T traumas get stored away into our subconscious until we actually need it. And when we are going through a very similar frustrating situation, our bodies are reacting along the central nervous system, along our central channel in a chakra, in an area that needs healing. And that's how we produce disease and discomfort in our bodies is because we have not addressed this age old trauma or habitual repeating trauma. So that's, that's what I do with my clients is I I get to the root of it. Okay. The the first thing I want to say is, I think it was Joe Vitale who said, woo woo. Yes. Means anything's possible. Ah, oh, yeah, I read his book. I oh, love okay. Ho'oponu Ono. Yeah, yeah. Woo woo means anything's possible. Thank you for reminding so, me. <laughs> so uh, I, try, I try to interject that because I, once again, you know, like too many people go, oh, it's woo woo. as so mm-hmm. it's a bad thing, but not necessarily. Okay, so if that seven year span overlays and overlays mm-hmm. and at some point in time you're going especially with trauma, I can see this connection now and it's getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Can you break that cycle? Can you stop? Can you deal with the trauma so that seven years from now it won't be there or as big or I don't know what the phrase is. Absolutely. Yeah. And is that where meditation comes in for you too? Meditation saved my life because it allowed me the space to be able to admit I knew about the trauma. Mm-hmm. I repressed it, but I knew about it. And it just finally came to a point where I was like, okay, I've got to do something about this. And it was because of the meditation that I began to have compassion on myself and began to realize that, hey, I, I need to find some help. And so I'm not the person to help people deal with their trauma unless it's something very very minor 
But meditation is an avenue that allows us to bring in compassion, bring in forgiveness, and also access that information like, huh, okay, I need to deal with this big T trauma. Let me sit here in meditation and kind of sit down with a question and just be like, who are all of the people? And you can ask the Holy Spirit or the angels, or you can ask source, or you can ask your higher self or your ancestors, or just quantum physics postulation that we're accessing the unified field. Any of these, right? We, we all come from something. And I believe that there's a universal consciousness. It doesn't matter if you capitalize that or not. <laughs> we can ask that wisdom that we have in our bodies, that, that information, who are some people that I remember talking about healing themselves? It could have been a famous person. It could have been somebody from high school that you saw in the grocery store. And they mentioned that their cousin's ex-wife, yada, yada. But when we get quiet, we can access that information and be like, oh, that's right. I remember Vishnu was talking about that. I'm going to reach out to him on Facebook and see if he can. So it might not be the end all be all, but it could be a breadcrumb that begins to lead you down that pathway to healing. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Oh, we got about four episodes coming up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I'd love to have you back just to go into that whole trauma thing a little bit more, not, not necessarily yours specifically, but, mm. you know, unfortunately, I think just about all of us know someone who has trauma and not always small T trauma mm. in their life. Mm -hmm. And they pretend they're okay, or they pretend that it's in the past, and even when they know it's not. So, mm -hmm. I, but as I said, I think <laughs> uh, that might be another episode if, if I can lure you back. <laughs> well, absolutely. I, I wrote an art piece, a, a book that does not go into detail about my trauma, but I. I wrote a collection of original poetry, 55 poems. And the first 21 deal with how I used meditation to forgive from that big T trauma. And then the next 34 poems are about me stopping drinking alcohol, which I was using to numb said trauma. And when I stopped drinking alcohol, I realized that I was needing alcohol in order to be intimate with my now ex-husband. So I came out of the closet as a gay woman at almost 40 years old. So those second 34 poems are about my use of meditation, especially in conjunction with nature, because I was 80 something days sober when quarantine hit in the United States. So I used the beach and parks and nature a lot in order to have that connection with where I find my higher power. So the book, which I hope you don't mind if I go ahead. And no, go no, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> my book is called Look Lush. And the first 21 poems, that part one is entitled Look. And it's about looking inside of ourselves. Like I said, it's there's not really a need for a trigger warning or anything. I mean, it does use that R word, but it's really not about the incident. It's about the healing and about my reason for healing myself because I do have two daughters. I have a biological daughter. I have a bonus daughter. And I know so many women who, I mean, there's a reason why the me too movement was what it was because the statistics are one in three women. I didn't report. None of the women that I know reported. It's so many of us. And then the second 34 poems are entitled lush because there's, that's a multifaceted loaded word, if you will, because something that's lush is green, it's prolific, it's beautiful. And in my neck of the woods, it's also terminology for somebody who drinks too much. And it can be used, you know, luscious, it can be used as a little bit of a sultry term. And because it does have to do with me coming out of the closet, you know, I will warn you that there are some, you know, more risque poems in, in that section, but, but nothing that a woman can't handle. 
So anyway, Look Lush is out on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can buy it from my publisher, Balboa Press, which is a division of Hay House. So you can get it on hayhouse.com. It's nine bucks in paperback. It takes less than an hour to read. And it's $4 on digital download. So very accessible. And it's just my first foray into publishing. I've written a lot of things, won some awards for it. But this is my first time getting out a little art piece. And there's many more to come. That's great. I I was going to ask you about your book before we closed. (laughs) The one place I did want to go before we end is you mentioned solutions. Mm -hmm. And when we were talking before I hit record, I said, oh, yeah, gratitude, affirmation, or meditation and exercise. And you were like, game. So you you got game, girl. (laughs) Tell, Tell us about game, please. Yeah, absolutely that's one of my signature talks. One of my signature talks is make your life into a game. And it's about this element of how we can play with our habits and have it stack in order to include gratitude, G, affirmations, A, meditation, M, and E, exercise. And exercise doesn't have to be working with a personal trainer and climbing a mountain or running the stadium steps. But just moving our bodies and getting into those places that are kind of uninhabited sometimes. Because in yoga, we say the issues are in the tissues. So when we establish a gratitude practice, whether that's every morning or every night, when we bolster that with affirmations, preferably used in the mirror, when we have a meditation practice that's regular, and when we have an exercise practice that's regular, All of these things have been proven to boost our mood, increase quality of life, especially meditation improves memory as we age by reducing areas of the brain associated with stress, which ages the brain and increasing areas of the brain associated with longevity, especially with making healthy choices and being more resilient. I mean, It's out there. Just look it up. There's lots of studies. There's meta studies. So the studies that collect all of the different studies and time and time again, meditation is beneficial for our literal bodies. It improves our brain just by the fact that it makes you, makes anybody more positive. That has been proven. Happier people live longer unequivocally. So make your life into a game. Yes, that's one of the pocket-sized solutions. I think that these are really portable things. And one of the biggest takeaways, though, is you don't want to try to implement G, A, M, and E all at the same time. I had a course that I was running with uh, women specifically in order to learn how to incrementally add these things to our lives. And um, now that's being launched on a different program out of Australia. So I've, I've pulled back off my website, that information, but that will be available to a select uh, VIP group very soon. So I'm, you know, not really read a book, the one by James Clear about habits called atomic habits. And you can use some of these hacks like habit stacking so that if you want to learn how to meditate, And you already have a habit that you do, like every single morning, you pour your coffee and while you wait for it to cool, you scroll through Facebook. Well, you can choose to leave your phone on the charger. And after you pour your coffee, while you wait for it to cool, you sit there and take three minutes to yourself to reorganize your brain or to organize your day or to somehow write a gratitude list. That's when you do your affirmations, you know, that's called habit stacking. So you bring a positive habit into a habit that you already have. And you can't sip your coffee until you've accomplished that new habit. So lots of different hacks like that to incrementally. And then once you do that for several weeks, then you add in the next letter, whether that's the G or the A, whichever one you choose to tackle first. So there okay. you go. <laughs> I, have, I have two questions before we before we wrap. Yeah. Um, 
what haven't, I mean, this is a loaded question and okay. I'm going to try to just keep it perhaps with meditation and game and things like that. What haven't I asked you? What haven't we talked about that you want boomer women to think about or to know? Well, I think that the top tips I have, because because my vision for the world is that everyone will meditate. That is how I want to, it's not really my legacy, it's the legacy that I want the world to learn. Deepak Chopra says, if we can just teach every eight-year-old how to meditate, we will have world peace in one generation. So my big, crazy vision for the world is that everyone will meditate. And so three tips. Number one, let go of expectation. Number two, keep trying until you find the kind that works for you. And number three, once you find it, keep at it. Make it a practice. It's not called meditation perfection. It's called meditation practice. We practice a lot of things. We practice medicine. We practice law. We practice yoga. It's not a performance. It's a practice, which means we keep on coming back to it. And we keep trying and we keep getting better. And we give ourselves a whole heap of grace. So those are my top three tips. Give up expectation. Find the kind that works for you and stick to it. Okay, last question. Yes, (laughs) (laughs) ma'am. I started by asking you how you got into meditation. Yeah. How is your life different now than pre-meditation, pre-healing? That is such a loaded question. My life is, you know what? I've got to write that down because I want to put out a reel how my life is different. Of course, it's incremental. But I was talking to my wife last night. And I was in happy tears. It's because of meditation that I stopped drinking alcohol. Because I started recognizing what I was doing. My my 18-month-old daughter picked up a little cup and said, this is my wine. And I was able to see that for what it was and the example that I was inherently teaching my daughter to emulate. And it's because of getting sober that I have so much personal freedom. Being raised in the South, I never felt like I could be myself and come out of the closet because I knew I was in church every Sunday and every Sunday night and every Wednesday night for church group. And I went to school there Monday through Friday that homosexuality was not something that my parents were ever going to accept. But it all started with meditation. And so my life, in answer to your question, is vastly different because I am no longer quick to anger. And that is an effect of the meditation. People who meditate regularly have easier time dealing with their emotions. They become less angry. They have more emotional regulation because it amplifies this area of the brain that deals with our emotional regulation. But also I had fits of anger because I wasn't living as my authentic self. I wasn't free to be myself. So I am happier. I am easier to be around. I am more pleasant. I am a better mother. I'm a better stepmother. (laughs) I'm a better daughter. I'm a better sister. I am fully me and exponentially me because I started meditating and because I started getting quiet and that was just a cascade effect of healing. And and I will say it started with yoga. You know, the issues are in the tissues. <laughs> and talk about the, the rape trauma. That was definitely in my tissues. 
right? But the meditation is the one thing where I can say that is a line of demarcation in my life. I was five months pregnant when I learned TM and my now ex-husband was astounded after about six weeks of me meditating for 20 minutes twice a day because my emotions as a third trimester pregnant woman changed. Instead of being up and down and all over the place, I was better able to handle the emotions of pregnancy. And you can imagine what they did, what that did to my life once I actually gave birth. So if that will make such, and my ex-husband actually learned, he learned TM because of, he saw the change in me. So if it'll make that big of a difference in somebody who's got hormones flying all over the place, Think about what it can do for somebody that's not pregnant and is more emotionally stable and has maybe dealt with some of their trauma. You know? Okay. Um, I'm going to call you on one thing there because I have, Please. I have you on video. Is okay. You were using your hands. You're talking with your hands and yes. you were talking about the increments. Yes. Do you see what just happened to that hand that was increments? It went down. The uh-huh. increments, your increments should be going in that direction. <laughs> okay so next time you're on video you've got to take those hands up because it was just mm. so exciting watching your face come alive I appreciate that I feel like for me I was up here trying to be something I think that that's the metaphor in my mind I was I was trying to I was pretending I was trying, I was standing on a ledge trying to pretend. And, and let me tell you, I was, I was borderline suicidal at many points before I got sober and before I came out. And so for me, it was a stepping down into being grounded and being authentically me instead of reaching and trying to be someone else. However, I will take your advice because that is a natural progression to feel like we're leveling up. And additionally, in TM, we use this analogy of the ocean, where our conscious thoughts are on the surface of the ocean, where it's very tumultuous. But when we begin to go down to the seafloor, and I found that that was very counterintuitive. When I first started learning about TM, I thought, why are we going down? That doesn't seem good. But it is where that that seafloor bottom is very peaceful, very quiet. And that's where the thoughts begin to bubble up from our subconscious or from the universal consciousness or from the unified field. It bubbles up from that quiet place. So it's kind of a a very different analogy. However, you're right. And thank you. (laughs) Well, I think the only reason uh, just yesterday I was interviewing somebody and we talked about that negative downward spiral, Mm -hmm. but how... with a lot of work you can create the upward positive spiral and I think that's where you know as you were talking things were becoming so much more positive in your life and I was thinking of the upward spiral (laughs) as your hands were going down so I wasn't criticizing it was just and it was I I appreciate the conversation we just had here now so that's great I like that yeah thank you where do we find you online on the world wide web yeah you can find me on my website as well as I'm very active on Instagram, the handle and the link are one and the same. It's Sarah Webb says. So that's Sarah Webb says.com S A R A W E B B S A Y S. And then my Instagram handle is exactly the same at Sarah Webb says. Okay. Uh, You hold workshops. I do. I have one coming up tomorrow night. Well, Well, probably not tomorrow night as this is released. But yeah, find the workshops on my website. I ha- I do private events. I do corporate events. I've done Sweet 16s. I, I work a lot <clears throat> in the medical field, basically just training corporations, especially small ones, how to deal with stress, how to breathe properly, how to get out of that fight or flight, how to meditate. And I do bespoke custom coaching For a select few clients at a time, I take two women only at a time in 13 week increments. And I have some group things that are on the horizon 
because my coaching is so in demand. I do have a wait list. You can sign up for the wait list on my website for my coaching. And because I've got such a long wait list, people are asking if we can do some more, you know, group coaching. And so we're trying to build out some programs for that. That's great. I, I don't know if you heard the helicopter that just went over. I'm thinking, please I didn't. keep talking. Please keep talking because no, this I helicopter <laughs> was really low. <laughs> okay. Um, They're coming to get the cougars, huh? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Our listeners know that your links are going to be in the show notes so they can find you in what is probably a more intimate space than, than here. Listeners, if you have comments on today's show, please talk to us. If you're listening at twoboomerwomen.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and leave comments there. We can be found at iHeart, Spotify, Verbal, even Amazon. Most places a person would listen to podcasts. Feel free to leave comments there and please leave stars and reviews. They help us grow. Before you go, hit the subscribe or follow button and you'll be notified about future interviews with more of my great guests. Now, I always suggest you share episodes with someone who needs the information we talk about. Today, I hope the person you share with needs only more information about meditation and its benefits, that they don't need help to heal from any sort of trauma. And as I say that, Sarah, I'm really hoping that you will come back um, sometime maybe this fall and we can, you know, delve into that a little bit more deeply because it is huge. It's a huge, huge subject. Absolutely. I'd be delighted. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you want to be a guest on the podcast or know someone who would be a great guest, there's an application form at the website. Sarah Webb, thank you so much for being my guest on Two Boomer Women today and sharing your story, your healing journey, sharing so much. Thank you. Thank you. Many blessings. Have a great rest of the week.